massacre the Syrian people. Pretty extraordinary stuff. That's all the time I have. I've run up against the 3 o'clock hour. This is Mark Levine. This is the Inside Scoop. Uh, coming up next is Maya Rockymore. If you want to find out more about me, go to MarkLevineTalk.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Mark Levine Talk, And by all means, uh, subscribe to my Facebook fan page, the Mark Levine fan page, and uh, let me know what you thought of today's show. Like I said, that's all the time I have. Next up is Maya Rockymore. This is Mark Levine signing off. a trifecta of scandals that have were rocked inside the Beltway. And the question is, what effect will this have on the Obama second term agenda? The scandals that we're talking about include everything from the Justice Department actually uh, going after the Associated Press uh, to Benghazi, uh, the follow-up in terms of what's happened with the State Department uh, in the aftermath of the murder of three State Department employees, including the U.S. Ambassador to Libya, and the IRS, uh, the scandal that involves the Internal Revenue Service supposedly looking at applications for 501c4s and really scanning for Tea Party uh, organizations uh, asking them all kinds of questions related to whether they were legitimate organizations, who their donors were. Anyway, we have a trifecta of scandal uh, that has rocked Washington, D.C. Uh, Democrats are working overtime to try to uh, launch a defense uh, that uh, against some of these uh, scandals. However, I think that we see uh, some of them actually gaining steam and getting legs. So what will be the effect on the Obama second term agenda? Will we have to see. However, uh, there, is, uh, there is a suggestion that indeed uh, the Democrats and Republicans will be so uh, at odds with each other that, uh, that it will be hard to get an agenda through. That is what some people are arguing. Others are arguing, including the White House, that despite uh, the animosity between the Republicans and the Obama administration, that there is still work to be done. In fact, on the Today Sunday shows, Dan Pfeiffer, representing the White House, was going after the Republicans, saying that, indeed, they were, uh, they were being too hard on Obama uh, however, at the same time, he was saying, even though you're being too hard on Obama, we have work to do with regards to deficit and debt reduction. So it's interesting to see that the White House is still trying to keep an olive branch uh, on the table uh, to make room for uh, the grand bargain, so to speak. So, uh, you know, it's good to, in it's interesting to see uh, what will happen. And I project uh, that uh, certainly we will see a derailing of the, uh, of the, of the agenda. So what's the real scandal? What is the real scandal, Peter? Unemployment? Unemployment uh, continues to be 
absolutely too too high. Underemployment, too high. We have a lost generation. So unemployment is a scandal that we need to be talking about. And we will in this show, later on in the show, we will be joined certainly by some very esteemed colleagues. Roger Hickey, the co-director of the Campaign for America's Future. Richard Eskow, the senior fellow uh, at the Campaign for America's Future and a blogger for ourfuture.org. We'll be talking about the austerity politics uh, and the issue of unemployment. Uh, what else is the scandal? Wage stagnation is a scandal. The fact that we've had several decades of stagnating wages for most working Americans is an incredible scandal that we're not talking enough about. And we will be talking about that in our show today. Wealth inequality is another scandal. The fact that we've had hyper wealth inequality in this nation and the nation's 1% are getting richer while the rest of the nation falls behind. And so we absolutely need to pay attention to the real scandals that are rocking Washington and America and, uh, and get beyond uh, some of the more spurious scandals that we're seeing. With that, uh, we have Leticia Miranda. She is a senior policy advisor at the National Council of La Raza, here to talk about the politics of immigration reform, specifically as it pertains to Social Security. Uh, Leticia, are you with us? Yes, I am. Hello, Maya. Hi, Leticia. Welcome. Uh, so the uh, S Senate Bill 744, what is it? So that is the, the big immigration reform bill that was put together by the gang of eight senators that they um, put out about a month ago, a little over a month ago. And currently it's still in the, being considered by the Judiciary Committee, which about two weeks ago offered 300 amendments to the bill. And so the amendment that we're concerned about is called Hatch 24, mm -hmm. which would um, change current law and say that um, all of these aspiring citizens, those who have... Um, gained the first step onto the path to citizenship, would not be able to get any credit for the Social Security contributions that they have already made. So, so let people know, law. the people who aren't familiar with what the pathway is, what the first step, when you say that, who are you talking about? Um, the first step in the pathway to citizenship is a, is a status called um, resident provisional immigrant status, mm -hmm. calling it RPI status. So. That, that's just the very first step that um, people, will allow people to come out of the shadows. And um, it, they would have the legal right to work in this country, and they would get a Social Security number mm -hmm. once they prove that they um, – there, there's a number of things they need to prove before they're able to get the RPI status, but including um, you know, that they, that they are not felons or you know, criminals and what have you, and they also have to pay a fine – um, to get onto that that first step, and there there are a number of other requirements. They have to prove that they that they don't owe any taxes with the IRS, that any tax bills have been settled, um, and there's a number of other requirements. But anyways, it, they would have 10 years in that status in the regional provision, uh, the resident provisional immigrant status, um, before they're able to apply for a legal permanent residency. And during the 10 years, they would have to reapply once for the RPI status at the sixth year, again, proving that they have not um, had any trouble with the law and that they're paying their taxes and also that their wages, their in family income is above the poverty level and that they have not um, utilized public benefits. And that kind of thing. So to be clear, the Hatch uh, Amendment actually Anybody who actually qualifies for RPA, RPI status over that 10-year period, they will not be uh, able to get access to the Social Security uh, or the Social Security contributions credits that they make during that 10-year well, period. Well, actually, those who um, those who gain their legal permanent residency status, so after the 10 years in RPI status, when they're finally able to get legal permanent residency, mm -hmm. it says that. Um, any of the contributions they made before they gained their RPI status would mm. not count okay. towards their, you know, their earnings history and so on. Okay. So. Now, Leticia, you well know that there are organizations out there, particularly on the right, uh, that are arguing that because uh, these Social Security numbers were gained uh, illegally, uh, that they, they, that individuals uh, who are undocumented don't deserve to get access to those Social Security benefits. What's your answer? What's NCLR's answer to those people? 
Um, well, the compact, the Social Security compact, says that people who contribute and work and you know contribute taxes do have a right to the benefits that they have received. And once somebody gains their legal status, the, you know, current law says that they can um, claim credit for all their prior contributions. They need to correct their earnings history and put it um, associate it with their current new Social Security number. But current law, that's current law, and we believe current law should stay, and that the compact, the Social Security compact, should extend to aspiring citizens. Mm -hmm. so. And so, um, basically, you're saying that let the law stand uh, and that uh, allow them to uh, make that adjustment uh, without uh, addressing the issue of how they acquired that, uh, that Social Security number. Right. Okay. Yeah. So talking about, uh, what about, I mean, I think people are confused about those who have uh, undocumented immigrants who have um, Social Security numbers that were obtained uh, in a way that was otherwise uh, other than legal, and individual taxpayer identification numbers. Mm -hmm. What is the ITIN, and, and, and how many Im uh, immigrants have it? Oh, the, the individual taxpayer identification number, the I-10, um, was created in the 90s to enable people who did not have a Social Security number to enable them to pay their taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so the, the IRS's opinion is that if you're earning income here in the United States and you have a, a tax payment that is due, that the IRS doesn't, is not concerned with your immigration status. They just want you to pay taxes on that income that was earned here in the United States. Mm -hmm. So that's why they created the I-10 to enable millions of undocumented immigrants to make the Social Security payments that they, that they legally needed to pay. So, Do you have a sense of what percentage actually have I-10s? Oh, there's a um, I'm No, I'm not sure mm -hmm. what percentage have I-10s, but okay. the Social Security Administration about two weeks ago put out a new fact sheet saying that over three million work workers have been are paying their social security tax. So let's talk about that because I think this is the big secret that most Americans don't know. How much do undocumented immigrants actually pay into the social security trust funds? Oh, so in 2010, it was 13 billion dollars in contributions that they made to social security. B so with a billion, billion as in billion. billion. Yeah, billion. So Social Security Administration just came out with a really good fact sheet about two weeks ago that specified it in much more detail and updated numbers that I had seen before. So 13 billion, and uh, there were other previous news reports from social with Social Security Administration interviewed, and they said in total about 11 percent of the trust fund had been contributed by undocumented immigrants. That's so, amazing. 11 yeah. percent of the trust and fund. They also state that it's extended the solvency of the trust fund by six years. And currently, they have no access to those contributions. Right. Unless they gain their legal status, mm -hmm. they would never have a right to receive the benefits. So what we're saying is since, you know, so many, hopefully millions of people are going to gain their legal status with immigration reform, then let's make sure that they're able to update their, their records and um, get credit for all those contributions they already made. And some Republicans are actually arguing that this will actually cost the Social Security trust funds more uh, if uh, there is a broad swath of undocumented immigrants that are made legal and then they get access to those benefits. What's your answer to that? Well, again, we, ha we owe it to the Social Security actuaries who, again, just less than two weeks ago, put out a great letter in response to this question from Senator Rubio. So. Mm -hmm. They did this analysis, and they, they did a 10-year cost, like how, how would it, the immigration reform bill affect Social Security in the next 10 years? And they estimate that it will increase revenue to Social Security by over $300 billion. Mm -hmm. So that's increased net revenue. That's minus the cost. So it's an additional $300 billion over 10 years. So they're right now still doing the analysis to see what is the impact over 75 years. Mm -hmm. But because immigrants are, tend to be so much younger and they're and they have children, they have a slightly higher birth rate than other Americans, um, that the, all those additional workers who, you know, these children grow up to be workers and taxpayers, mm -hmm. that it has such a tremendous positive effect on the trust fund that it's, it's totally a net positive for the trust fund and the country. The, the other two big pieces of important data in that, that letter that they recently did um, 
they said that um, economic growth would be increased by 1.63% by the 10th year and that it would create an additional 3.2 million jobs. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. So, um, I mean, most of it, um, I think Americans underestimate the importance of a growing population, like how positive that is for mm -hmm. our country. So, so, and last question for you is that uh, Latinos actually heavily rely on Social Security, right? Yes. Yes, Latino seniors, and as as well as disabled workers, and so on. Yes. And so, you know, it, in terms of economic security for retirees, disabled individuals, et cetera, in the Latino community, it makes up a significant portion of their uh, retirement security. For example, right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Hispanics are more likely to to rely on Social Security for almost all of their income mm -hmm. compared to a lot of other groups. So, about fifty three percent of Hispanic seniors. Um, rely on Social Security for 90% of their income or more. So they have a huge stake in the future of the program. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. denying them the, all the newly, you know, the aspiring citizens, if we denied them their, you know, credit for all their prior contributions, that would really reduce their benefit levels when they're seniors, as well as it could even um, cause some people to lose eligibility for the program altogether for yeah. those who are older. All right, Leticia Miranda, Senior okay. Policy Advisor, National Council La Raza. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Maya. Thanks. You are listening to Pivot Point with Maya Rocky Moore, sponsored by the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. We'll be right back after the break with Paul Nathanson, Executive Director of the National Senior Citizens Law Center. This is John Bauman. You know me best as Bowser, formerly of the group Sha Na Na. And you know, when we were rocking and rolling all those years ago, I wasn't particularly worrying about my retirement or how I'd pay for health care. But now that I'm 65, I really understand the importance of Medicare, not just for myself, but for generations of working Americans who need secure health care as they get older. That's why this election is so important. The Romney Ryan Coupon Care Plan will mean the end of traditional Medicare. It gives seniors a partial payment which loses value over time and raises our health care costs as much as $500 more each month. Coupon Care also puts us at the mercy of private insurers, making it harder to pick our own doctors. All of this to pay for tax cuts for the wealthy? Are you kidding me? Americans of all ages say no to Coupon Care. Bum 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 dang a dang dang a ding a dong ding preserve Medicare. You're listening to We Act Radio WPWC fourteen eighty AM. Visit us online at weactradio.com. Welcome back to Pivot Point. I'm your host, Maya Rocky Moore, and I am pleased to welcome to the show again for his second appearance, Paul Nathanson, the Executive Director of the National Senior Citizens Law Center. Welcome, Paul. Paul, are you with us? Hello, Paul. Okay. Oh, there we go. Paul, welcome, welcome. You are on mute, I guess. Okay. So I understand that you released a report, a transition report, this week. Well, this was uh, put together by a group called Strength and Social Security, mm -hmm. and the Law Center and various other groups really were part of it. Women's Law Center, uh, Joan Enmacher and I were the co-chairs of the committee that put it together, uh, but there were a lot of uh, contributors. It's focused really, frankly, on the, on the fact that... Um, the social, it's about the administration of the Social Security program mm -hmm. uh, and issues that are arise. I mean, uh, as I've said for a long time, you can have a, a very good statute that creates the Social Security program, and it's a wonderful program, and as we all know, it benefits lots of people and, and uh, hasn't missed a check and, it, and run with a very small uh, administrative overhead, less than 1%. But... Uh, there are problems, and uh, if you really want to judge how a program works, I think you need to judge in the end how does it play out on the street, and if there are administrative problems with the appeals or if uh, language access is a problem, 
then um, oftentimes people don't get the benefits that they're intended to get. So that's what this focuses on. And the desire, the, the uh, import and the intent was to provide guidance to uh, a new Social Security commissioner, uh, which who should be appointed by President Obama, hopefully in the next uh, near period of time. I was going to ask, do we have one yet? No, we don't. Uh, they do we even have a nominee? No, they're appointed for six, uh, a six-year term, so the current uh, commissioner, Commissioner Astru, was really appointed by President Bush, and his term has ended, and we're waiting for President Obama to uh, uh, make, another no- make a nomination, and once that nomination happens, we're, we're hoping that this report will provide some guidance on some of the administrative issues that need to be addressed. Indeed, the report outlines five administrative issues, and one of them, actually, I, I was educated by the report because I didn't understand how the administrative financing of the Social Security Fund uh, is now going through a regular annual appropriations process, Right. which, of course, does not touch the trust funds itself, but has implications for the administration of the pro- program itself. Can you talk about that? Well, a little. I mean, the, the fact is that the, the, the Social Security program is really self-financing, and uh, the, the fact that it has to go through this annual uh, process really seems unnecessary, makes it more political than it, than it ought to be. Um, and I would add, by the way, the sequestration, uh, when people have heard about this process of sequestration, cutting funds, although it doesn't affect the Social Security uh, benefits, it does actually affect the administration of the program. So there are fewer, you know, less funds available to... Uh, uh, administer Social Security, resulting in office closures and the, the kinds of things that affect people on a daily basis uh, when they want to interface with this probably most important program uh, on the American scene. And un- indeed, doesn't it undermine public understanding and confidence? In fact, that was a second uh, area that you all said needed to be shored up. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you if you cut uh... for example the annual statement many all of us got a statement annually that told us what the benefit would be when we retire if we're currently in the workforce well and that's really important because it, it allows uh, younger people especially uh... you hear so many younger people saying well i don't think it'll be there for me or whatever mm-hmm. but when you get a statement annually that says you know if you continue working as you are now your benefit will be such and so uh, it gives you a sense uh, of the reality, which is the program will be around, and it is in uh, very good financial shape compared to almost every other federal program. I mean, it's not in any crisis status. And to the extent that uh, information for the public is is uh, lacking, you know, it really plays into those who want to make the program look as though it's uh, it's insecure and it needs to be privatized and you know the agenda frankly of the right mm-hmm. which has been to to undermine and cut the program what was the justification by the way of eliminating the annual statement well i think they talked about finances i mean mm-hmm. uh, we had meetings with the uh, commissioner asked you and uh, they said it had to do with needing to save money now they're talking about putting back a statement doing it online uh, and again, online is nice, but if you're older uh, and you don't have access, or older and or poor, uh, and you don't have automatic or easy access to the Internet, that's, that's more difficult. Um, and they're talking about doing it selectively, you know, for every few years. But uh, they, the rationale was uh, cutting the funds. And it, it, but, but politically, it, it, uh, I mean, if, if one were a little paranoid, and, you know, I'm... <laughs> I'm in that camp sometimes. Uh, you know, it looks like you're really wanting to undercut the faith in the program and right. by doing that kind of thing. And actually, that leads to a third area that you all talked about in the report, and that is access and customer service. That uh, for limited English proficiency uh, individuals and the disabled, uh, the access and customer service are paramount, and yet they're suffering. Yeah, I mean they're closing programs. They're cl- I mean they're cu- curtailing hours. Um, they're, they have, they don't have, you know, over, for example, the SSI program, which is a program administered by Social Security for low-income individuals, uh, a third of the applicants are, are uh, speaking a language other than English as their primary language. Uh, there's a lack of, uh, of interpreters. 
Um, offices are closing, fewer, you know, small, uh, fewer number of hours that they're open. Uh, there has been over the years uh, a uh, sort of a lack of sense of customer service. I mean, and I don't know, this isn't the, necessarily the day-to-day workers, but if the message is sent from the top, uh, of, of uh, this kind of, uh, I mean, and Social Security has always been really customer oriented. So when you cut the funds, um, you have less hours to open, close close offices, don't have language uh, uh, accessibility, don't uh, provide material. We had to. The law center had to three years ago uh, sue the Social Security Administration mm. in, a, in a nationwide class action to force it to provide materials for the blind in Braille. Mm. You shouldn't have to do that. Right. And we fought them. I mean, it was very interesting. I mean, they, in other words, and this isn't the rank-and-file workers. It was their lawyers, um, basically, where the judge in a nationwide class action had to order them to put material for blind people in Braille. And you actually tried to work it out with them before suing them? Absolutely. And they wouldn't do it? They wouldn't do it. And the judge in the case, and this is, always gets me, said to the Social Security Administration, you have been so recalcitrant at every stage of the game, you have come up with every lame excuse in the book. This is a federal judge talking to the Social Security Administration mm-hmm. about translate, putting material into Braille for blind people. Mm-hmm. And again, I'm, I love the agency. I mean, I think, you know, it is a wonderful program. And so I'm caught as an advocate between, you know, wanting to be supportive. I don't want to provide material to those who want to... Uh, you know, attack the program because mm-hmm. it is a, a terrific program. But you know, we need to be honest. Uh, there are administrators who sort of drag their feet. I mean, mm-hmm. and they're on the language access, on the accessibility, the appeals process. There's a constitutional right um, to have your benefits paid while you're appealing mm-hmm. under a case called Goldberg versus Kelly many years ago. Well, and they have good regulations, but they don't follow those rules. Well, it's interesting that you say that because the fourth area is disability determinations and appeals. And when I went around the country in 2005 talking to um, audiences about Social Security, African-American audiences were very hostile when it came to Social Security disability. Almost everyone, uh, a significant number of individuals I ran into had a family member who had applied and was unable to get access or had been denied uh, uh, Social Security disability benefits. And then I went online and did more research and found out that the Office of Research at the Social Security Administration had actually done studies showing that um, that lower income people, people of color, tended to be denied at a higher rate. Even in the appeals process, they tended to be denied at a higher rate. Uh, they attributed it to a lack of uh, legal assistance. Right. But, you know, this disability program seems to have significant troubles, not the least of which is the backlog. Well, there's a tremendous backlog, and they've actually been making some uh, incremental uh, improvements in it. You know, it's been a year, two years to get your appeal heard, or or even to get onto the disability program, and now that's sliding back because of the mm-hmm. lack of, of funding. Um, I do. You, you mentioned the, the racial issue. You know, one of the things that we didn't mention in the report but that uh, we're beginning to explore, and I, I know you and I have, have talked about this, is the fact that the data is not reported by race. So we don't really know, uh, you know, how are different subpopulations being treated? Uh, is it accurate to say that, you know, in terms of their uh, African Americans and, and the appeals process, uh, that's being done slower with respect to them? I mean, the threshold is we need the information. So there's not even any any inclusion at this stage. Uh, I think they did it at one point, but they're not doing it now, of, of race data. Which actually brings us to the fifth area, which is research, that the Social Security Administration's Policy and Research Division has actually been weakened, that their, um, that their studies are not, no longer as good as they once were. And I think that this issue of reporting uh, uh, data by race and ethnicity is an indication of that as well. The fact that they got a, uh, basically they eliminated reporting it by race and ethnicity without telling anybody. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, you know, we had to go as researchers and advocates to the latest annual statistical supplement and search for the data and not find it and ask questions before they actually admitted that they eliminated the data. This is quite disturbing on a number of levels, but it speaks to the fifth issue, and that is the quality of research put out by the Social Security Administration. Well, I think that that's that's right. I mean, again, I did, 
I'm not as directly involved in our in our office, but I know the report talks about it. And I think again, it's a question of funding. It's a question, and and you know, it, uh, it is possible that there are political underlying decisions. I don't, again, I I don't want my paranoia to come out too much, but uh, when you don't collect data, uh, when you limit research, obviously you you limit the tools that are available to advocates to to point out inadequacies in the program. That's right. So I think that's a major issue. Especially in, in my perspective, because the nation's demographics are changing. We just talked to Leticia about immigration right before we talked to you. Uh, because we have a rising uh, majority uh, that are people of color, that we need to understand this program and how it interfaces with people of color on an even greater basis than we have in the past. And so it is disturbing, and I hope that we can get to the bottom of it. So, Paul Nathanson, thank you so much for joining me today. Okay, great. I hope to have you on again in the future. Okay, thank you very much. That was Paul Nathanson, the Executive Director of the National Senior Citizens Law Center. They do terrific work, uh, legal advocacy work around our nation's social insurance programs and SSI. So with that, uh, you are listening to Pivot Point with Maya Rocky Moore. I will be right back after the break with two incredible guests, uh, Roger Hickey, co-director of the Campaign for America's Future, and Richard Escal, senior fellow at the Campaign for America's Future. You're listening to We Act Radio, WPWC, 1480 AM. Visit us online at weactradio.com. Social Security and Medicare. These programs touch the lives of virtually every American family. Yet with so much misinformation out there, Americans are pretty confused about their future. You deserve the truth. For more than 30 years, the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare has been leading the fight to preserve our nation's most successful programs. Join us and find out how to keep Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid strong for all generations. Learn more online at thetruthnow.org. This is John Bauman. You know me best as Bowser, formerly of the group Sha Na Na. But these days, I'm rocking and rolling nationwide as part of the Truth Tour with the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. Some politicians claim they want to protect Medicare, but the truth is they support the Romney Ryan Coupon Care Plan, which would end traditional Medicare. This could raise our health care costs as much as $500 more each month. Ending Medicare doesn't protect it. Learn the facts and join our national campaign at thetruthnow.org. Welcome back to Pivot Point. I'm your host, Maya Rocky Moore, and it is my pleasure to welcome to the show Roger Hickey, the co-director of the Campaign for America's Future. Welcome, Roger. Thank you, Maya. And via phone, Richard Escal, senior fellow for, at the Campaign for America's Future and a blogger for ourfuture.org and the Huffington Post. Welcome, Richard. Okay. And so with that, is austerity dead? You know... We've been living through this terrible period of recession and then uh, the additional insult and injury of, of deficit reduction that is making the, the recovery harder and harder to, uh, to get any steam. That's what austerity is. Uh, we're imposing it on our country and they're imposing it in Europe. And as a result, the world economy is not growing. And, it, it, and the... The great thing is that this idea of austerity has been intellectually destroyed in recent months. Debunked. Debunked. Uh, everybody is admitti admitting from the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, to Harvard University. Harvard University um, uh, professors who admit that they had errors in their spreadsheets. Uh, it, it's been very, very clear now that this, um, this medicine that's been prescribed by the witch doctors is, is bleeding our economy. And yet, the whole thing is on automatic pilot. So we are continuing to see sequestration mm -hmm. sap the strength of, of the economy. Uh, the, uh, the jobs numbers are very, very weak. 
And there is no sign uh, that the austerity program is going to be uh, put on hold or stopped. What we ought to be doing is in, in investing in more jobs. Mm -hmm. But we're not doing that. We're not doing that in Europe either. Richard Escal, have you joined us yet? I'm here. Richard, you have an article uh, that says that austerity is dead. Tell us about your argument. Well, look, first of all, intellectually it's dead, but uh, Roger knows I just got back a little while ago from Africa where, you know, if a cow dies in the village water supply, it's dead, but it's still deadly. Um, and that's what I would say about austerity. Intellectually it's dead because the underpinnings such as they were, the, the rationale behind this, this kind of economic thinking has been completely discredited by events in Europe, by events here in the U.S. where we've seen shrinkage to the GDP, by the fact that ultimately, you know, they, they say they want to impose these austerity measures to reduce government deficits, but it doesn't even do that. We've seen in Europe it makes those deficits worse. So we have a model of what works, which is the kind of stimulus and jobs creation program that Roger was talking about, that we've seen work in this country, that we've seen work elsewhere in the world. We have the model of what doesn't work, which is this austerity economics. On top of that, we have the intellectual uh, discrediting, I would say, of many of its major arguments uh, that if um, you know government debt exceeds or public debt exceeds a certain fixed level, terrible things happen. We've seen that that's at best a spreadsheet error. So I, my answer would be intellectually it's dead, but it was never, you know, I would argue it was never primarily an intellectual movement. It was a movement uh, of economic self-interest on the part of certain parties parties that needed intellectual cover. So in that sense, it's very much alive and still very dangerous. So let's par parse this, because actually, uh, Roger, what is actually happening to the deficit as we speak? Well, for a variety of reasons, uh, the, the deficit is coming down right. faster than uh, the austerity mongers would have predicted. And it's uh, coming down without the job creation. It's coming down without the job creation uh, because... Um, through various budget deals, they've imposed um, mostly cuts in government spending, which means loss of jobs, plus a certain amount of tax increases on both the wealthy, this last deal, and the uh, reimposition of the Social Security tax, which hits everybody. Uh, but the total uh, result of all of this, and some amount of economic growth, um, means that the deficit is coming down. Um, we always knew that the deficit was a short-term problem immediately due to the recession and a long-term problem over many, many decades mm -hmm. because of health care costs. Mm -hmm. um, the short-term problem is, is being solved, and yet the austerity mongers, the Pete Petersons of the world, are still insisting that there be another big deficit deal that will mo only impose more, uh, more austerity and more job cutting uh, right when we should be investing in jobs. And that deal is actually referred to as the grand bargain. Uh, Richard, uh, what is the role of Freddie and Fannie and student loan payments uh, on reducing the deficit? Well, you know, this is a subject of, uh, you know, some some controversy here, but basically, you know, if you're talking about uh, the payments, the greater than expected payments that Freddie and Fannie have made back to the government, that, that that's part of the formula. The other is that right now, you know, student debt is underwritten by the government, so student loan repayments are going back into the government coffers. That helps, but, you know, it, it, as with many of uh, the ways we've approached deficit reductions so far, it helps, but at the expense of those who shouldn't be paying for it. You know, we have students graduating with horrendous levels of debt. Uh, I, some, many would argue overpaying for their education and entering a horrible job economy. Sure, they're repaying these student loans, and that's helping the deficit, but we should be going after and taxing the people who created this problem, right. Wall Street and others, and we should be using some of that money to help these young people get jobs uh, rather than expecting to extract uh, blood from a stone from, you know, this 
entire generation. That's the cynicism, cynicism of this, is that you have the deficit mongers like Erskine Bowles or Alan Simpson blaming greedy geezers and you know all that nonsensical rhetoric and saying that the younger people are being shafted uh, by the older people when they're the ones doing the shafting. We should be helping our young people get jobs. We should be helping our minority communities get jobs. We should be helping the long-term unemployed. And then they'll be paying taxes and they'll be paying and helping to reduce the deficit that way. So it's a very misguided approach we're and, taking. And Maya, there is just a, a report that just came out last week that shows the burden of student debt over decades of students now who are burdened with this kind of huge debt um, that people used to not have to impose on themselves to get a college education. The impact of that is keeping kids from going into the economy, from buying homes, from having a decent job. Uh, they're, they're living from pay, pay, paycheck to paycheck or with their parents. Mm -hmm. And the result is that the economy is once again uh, being slowed down uh, because of the burden of debt. So, uh, that's why we're supporting Elizabeth Warren's, um, the new senator from Massachusetts. She has a proposal to uh, reduce the interest rate charged on um, on student loans, bring it down to the rate that uh, big banks pay to the Fed to mm -hmm. borrow money, mm -hmm. which is virtually nothing. So uh, we ought to, if we're going to be subsidizing our banks in order to try to get the economy growing, we ought to be subsidizing our students mm -hmm. at that same rate as well. I actually agree with that. Richard, uh, I think that the average American person who's paying halfway paying attention to this conversation is, is confused. Uh, they're being told by the Obama administration that everybody should share in the sacrifice. Uh, and at the same time, uh, you know, we do know uh, that uh, that the 99 percent of Americans weren't responsible for getting us into our, our current uh, uh, debt dilemma. Uh, and so, you know, the the question becomes, you know, the the people who are really responsible. And you mentioned earlier the Pete Peterson crowd, the deficit hawks. Uh, they have uh, an agenda. And can you tell us about whose interests they're representing and why? Yeah, this is this is something that uh, people really don't understand, or a lot of people don't, and they really should. These people get on, come on TV, the Alan Simpsons and these characters, and they talk about how concerned they are about the well-being of the of the people at large, and then they start talking about a program that actually lowers taxes for corporations, which are at historically low levels my, in modern history, lower taxes even more for the wealthy that are still extremely low, and place if they deign to talk about quote unquote tax revenue increases at all it's usually by talking about eliminating the deductions that the middle class desperately needs like more home mortgage interest or uh, or employer paid health care deductions so they're really talking about the acceleration of the transfer of wealth to the top 1% and 0.1% and away from you know uh, to the night the, the reason why this shared sacrifice language frustrates me is that the 99% have sacrificed already you know uh, millions of people are uh, they should answer by saying i gave it the office i don't get to go to anymore because i've been out of a job <laughs> for 4 years that's exactly right and so the millions of others should be saying i gave in the stagnating wages that actually fell behind after the financial crisis in the bailout while wages for the top 1% jumped ahead. So we gave already. I think if we want shared sacrifice, it's time to talk about higher levels of taxation for corporations and higher ta levels of taxation for the wealthy and getting rid of some of the deductions that allow them to pay so little. I would argue that millions of others still would say we gave in the terms of our lost homes uh, and, and lost uh, home values uh, as a result of the foreclosure crisis that was jointly connected to the international financial crisis. So, I mean, really, there most of a America has been harmed and they've already given, they've already sacrificed. And so to make this argument about shared sacrifice, which, by the way, the Obama administration does make often, uh, is actually very disingenuous. Uh, what do you think, uh, Roger, uh, is the, the ultimate endgame of this austerity crowd? 
Well, the austerity crowd just wants more of the same, more of the transfer of wealth and power from uh, from the very bottom to the the majority of the Americans. So, are you the including top. the Obama administration in that? Well, they're confused. They they are they are they have been lobbied heavily by the people that finance political campaigns, mm -hmm. and they have been um, you know. Uh, uh, authenticating this austerity move by appointing Simpson and Bowles and, and, and trying to prove that they have a better way of reducing the deficit. The better way of reducing the deficit should be something that Obama talks about sometime, and that is investing in America's future, investing in kids, investing in jobs, in infrastructure, in, in the things that make our economy more productive. President Obama is very eloquent when he talks about that. But the problem is that he doesn't think such a program can pass, and it's certainly not going to pass in today's House of Representatives. So, well, I mean, the 2014 budget does contain investment in infrastructure and jobs. It does contain investment in early childhood education. And he talks about that. Right, right. Uh, at the same time, it contains something called the chain CPI. And there's this, this chasing of the grand bargain, which is, if, if he were to get it, would uh, make another blow against uh, economic recovery. So I started at the top of the hour talking about the trifecta of scandals that are taking place in Washington and the fact that Dan Pfeiffer, representing the White House on today's Sunday shows, was going after the Republicans, saying that they were absolutely unfair to President Obama uh, in terms of these scandals. However, they still wanted to actually make room for a grand bargain. Well, yeah. I mean, they've been trying to get Obama to, to do a grand bargain for, for ages. Uh, and it's been stymied, really, by uh, the Tea Party, who uh, refused to go along with any kind of tax hikes. But uh, the real scandal, the real scandal is that we're not talking about jobs. We're not talking about, about investing in the future. We're not talking about the growth that puts people to work and they become taxpayers and then the deficit comes down. Um, and we should not be distracted by the fact that we can't pass that in the current Congress. Mm -hmm. What we ought to be doing is every time we get a chance demanding that republicans really get behind a jobs program mm -hmm. and 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 point out that they are the ones that are preventing a jobs and growth agenda from happening and make that the issue not deficit reduction mm -hmm. for the next election mm -hmm. if we did that we'd probably win the next election so richard can we have it both ways can we demand from the republicans that uh, they stop being intransigent and get behind a job creation program not just any job creation program a massive significant uh, very expansive job creation program while at the same time congratulating them for actually uh, being uh, the people to stop the grand bargaining from happening thus far well see i don't see that as as having it both ways i i think they're two separate issues one uh, you know, I pray every day that they will be intransigent and stop the grand bargain. And two, you know, I think that uh, what we've seen here, first of all, I think there are two things going on. One is I think the Clinton uh, austerity team is deeply embedded in the uh, administration, but I agree with Roger that the president himself, there's and some of his other people, there's, there's ambiguity there. But what we've lacked in this entire dialogue for the past four years is a choice is a clear, stark choice between two visions of the future. The president articulates a growth choice from time to time, but doesn't follow it up. So people, what people are looking at now are, you know, the kindler, gentler, austerity hand versus the harsh one, as opposed to two competing visions, one of growth and one of diminishment. So I think that it's very important, A, to... Uh, be grateful to the Republicans uh, if and when they they squash a grand bargain, and and be really pressing the Democrats to present that growth vision and that jobs vision that Roger was describing. Because when we've seen that presented in on ambiguous terms, for instance, in the six months leading up to the 2012 election, Democratic fortunes soar as a result. So stick with that. It's right policy. It's right politics. That's what we should be insisting they do and settling for nothing less. So, Roger, what's next on the jobs front? Well, the Democrats need to roll out a big uh, common-sense jobs proposal. And, uh, and talk about it every time they get a chance. They ought to be uh, demanding that the Republicans um, take votes on everything from raising the minimum wage, which helps the economy, to investing in infrastructure, which helps the economy, to uh, student loan 
debt reduction that helps the economy and forcing um, the Republicans to show their true colors, which is that they're not for jobs at all. They're for austerity. They're for the rich. And uh, and then the, the Democrats have got to run as Democrats in the midterm elections, mm -hmm. saying, which side are you on? Uh, we're for growth. They're for the wealthy. Uh, make make the choice uh, to grow the economy and um, and incidentally bring down the deficit in a in a progressive way. Uh, I think that's beginning to happen. Certainly, there's a lot of groups outside of the Democratic Party who are going to be pushing for that strategy mm -hmm. and are going to be going out there and doing it, uh, demonstrating them in front of bridges that are collapsing in their neighborhoods, in, in their cities, and saying, this is the kind of job creation scheme that we ought to be financing. This stuff has to be done one time or another, and uh, interest rates are so low that it's now is the time to do it. Let's do a common sense jobs and growth growth campaign and uh, and let's uh, defeat the republicans in in so doing so richard the progressive caucus has actually been making that argument for some time now uh without much traction from their colleagues in in the house in fact you know they recently passed a budget that put jobs front and center uh or not passed but introduced a budget that put jobs front and center and you know got a tepid response uh from the house and from their own democratic colleagues what's going on in the Democratic caucus, and what do you think needs to happen to get them prepared for the 2014 elections? Well, I think there are two things going on. One is that uh, the, the austerity crowd has successfully stigmatized anything that seems progressive or seems to lean to the left. But the progressive caucus budget is supported, its key elements are supported by a majority of Republicans in most cases. This is the center. The new center is the kind of budget we're seeing out of the progressive caucus, the kind of those kinds of proposals. So I think, one, that message needs to be delivered. Two, I think they're up against an extremely uncooperative media that's embedded with the austerity crowd. So I think they have, they're fighting heavy headwinds there. And three, I've got to say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit at a remove from this side of it, but it may be that the influence of lobbyists and so on is also making it difficult for them to get ahead. But really, if you look at the polling um, and you look at uh, what the Progressive Caucus is offering, that is the mainstream desire of the American voter, and it should be getting massive play, and it's shocking to me that the Democratic leadership isn't pushing it harder. Roger, the White House, I, in today's shows, saw Dan Pfeiffer not only talked about grand bargain, keeping the olive branch on the table in the grand bargain, but also tax code reform. And it seems like this issue of tax simplification seems to be something that they are both giving, uh, you know, at least verbal uh, support for. Uh, but what are the pitfalls of, of that approach? Right. Well, tax reform can be good and progressive, or it can be very bad and regressive. It can be giving uh, more tax breaks to the wealthy. Mm -hmm. What the, uh, the, the Republicans who are pushing a grand bargain are talking about mm -hmm. is lowering tax rates, supposedly getting rid of loopholes that keep popping back up as soon as you do the, the legislation. And they are talking about cutting corporate taxes and moving to an international tax system that, that encourages companies like Apple currently uh, to take their profits and take them overseas. So um, uh, when somebody talks to you about tax reform, hold on to your wallet. It, it, it could be a, a very, very disastrous um, uh, process pushed by the deficit hawks, which actually worsens the deficit because it, it takes wealthy people and the corporations even more out of the business of financing government. Uh, we're going to have to have a big fight about that, um, apparently. Although, uh, interestingly, some of the corporations don't agree with other corporations about mm -hmm. which, which tax breaks they want to go for. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we may have a, a big nothing happen, which in this case is probably good. Uh, we ought to be asking the wealthy and the corporate elite to pay their fair share of, of governing America, and we ought to be investing uh, that money into uh, job creation that makes the economy more productive, including wealthy business people more productive. 
So both uh, Roger and uh, Richard have mentioned the issue of lobbyists. And uh, my question for you, Richard, I, when I, I've worked on the cap on Capitol Hill, I've actually worked on the Ways and Means Committee, which is the, the tax writing committee for the nation. And I have seen major corporations basically write portions of the tax code and have it enacted into law wholesale. Uh, and so my question uh, for you is, uh, do the American people have any friends in high places in Washington? Well, sure they do. I mean, I think that they don't have nearly enough, but look, we can be proud of of Senator Warren. We can be proud of Senator Sanders. We can be proud of uh, many of the people who keep up the good fight in the in the House Progressive Caucus. There are a lot of people there fighting for the good causes. I've left out quite a few of them. It'll be like an Oscar speech, you know. I'll be sorry I didn't mention six when I'm done, but 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 uh, the point is, yes, they have friends, but those friends don't have the wind at their back. And the reason why they don't have the wind at their back is, one, they're up against billions of dollars, and that's hard to fight. But two, I would argue that we have a job to do here, which is to make sure that every single elected official in America, even the most intransigent right-winger, that every single one of them hears from us frequently that, why aren't you backing what Senator Warren is doing? Why aren't you backing what Senator Brown is doing? Why aren't you backing what the House Progressive Caucus is doing? Over and over again to create, and to let our media know that they don't appreciate the slanted reporting either, to create as a constant drumbeat to give these people a little more wind at their backs. We're going to have to reform the political system, but until we do, we've got to be out there in the streets, as Roger says, and on the telephone and on the emails, letting people know what we think to give these people some more uh, support. So the problem is, Roger, that uh, people think that they did that with the 2012 election, that you actually have win when you're talking about progressive values and issues like job and a vision for the future that is very progressive. And yet then you get to the governing part of the equation and all of that goes away. Uh, how do you bring wind into the policy conversations and the governing uh, so that you don't have this kind of uh, uh, catch-22 that when the election rhetoric comes around, you have support? and then it diminishes as uh, you go into uh, governance. I would argue that we need one more big election, uh, at least one more, maybe two. Um, yes, when Obama was on the ticket, we managed to get him and his pollsters to understand that the American people, the voters, wanted to hear him talking about jobs, not mm -hmm. austerity, jobs. And that worked politically. Mm -hmm. But in the, in the 2010 elections, the off-year elections, the uh, the president was his basic message was we've done the stimulus have faith mm -hmm. um, the economy is going to grow jobs are going to come along and people voters had not seen the jobs whereas the republicans were out there campaigning uh that obama's a failure he hasn't produced jobs where are the jobs and that's really what lost us the house of representatives mm -hmm. and losing the house of representatives makes it almost impossible uh, to do big things. Mm -hmm. we, we can stop bad things, but we can't. Uh, we need one more election where the Democrats are actually, and Obama's not on the ticket anymore, uh, the, the Democrats have to make it a referendum on a jobs program that they put forward and that the American people get to vote for. So we know that the midterm elections are older and they tend to be wider. Yeah. Uh, that the Obamacare scare uh, in the 2010 elections, uh, death panels, et cetera, had an influence on older voters who were disproportionately represented among the voting base. Mm -hmm. I think that in midterm elections, that tends to be the trend about the demographics. And so what, what needs to happen, Richard, in, in this 2014 election in two respects? Uh, one is the uh, electorate uh, who is also going to be sensitive to the conversation about uh, austerity, particularly as it pertains to the CPI and Social Security. And, and two, well, how do we break this uh, bait and switch cycle uh, where you have um, elected officials on both sides of the aisle, uh, you know, um, hedging uh, in the uh, election cycle and, and talking progressive values and issues? And then you get to the governing side, and all of a sudden, uh, they are very sympathetic to big business as opposed to the 99%. 
Well, in terms of your first question, I think the first answer to that, in terms of the demographics of the upcoming election, is if the Democrats go along with passing the chain CPI cut, the 2010 blowout is going to look like a birthday party compared to what they see in 2014. We saw it in the polling that the Democrats' credibility on Social Security was 25 points ahead of the Republicans, plunged more than 25 points. They fell behind. Before the 2010 election, Obama polled as less trustworthy on Social Security than George W. Bush, which is a Astonishing. If the Democrats repeat that play by branding themselves as the party that cuts Social Security, they, they can forget about the House, number one. Number two, I, so I think they need to stay as far away from that as they can, make sure they fight to protect Social Security. And then in terms of this bait and switch, look, I think we as committed voters and citizens have to understand that our job doesn't end when we mark our ballot. It begins when we mark our ballot. And if politicians aren't doing what they promised to do, we've got to make our feelings known. And if they continue to break their promises, we got to talk about fielding primary challengers and whatever it takes to let them know there's a price to be paid for betrayal. And that is going to have to be the last word. Thank you, Richard Eskow, Senior Fellow, Campaign for America's Future and blogger for OurFuture.org. And Roger Hickey, Co-Director of the Campaign for America's Future. Roger, what is the website? OurFuture.org. OurFuture.org. Please visit. Thank you for joining me for yet another edition of Pivot Point with Maya Rockymore. I want to give a special shout out to our sponsor, the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. And I'd also like to thank our producer, uh, Peter James Callahan, for the excellent work he does here. Please join us every Sunday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time on WeActRadio.org or 1480 a.m. if you live in the Washington, D.C. area. Until next time, America. Listening to We Act Radio, WPWC, 1480 AM. Visit us online at weactradio.com.
You're listening to Win Workers Independent News, a production of Diversified Media Enterprises. I'm Doug Cunningham. More than a thousand Las Vegas taxi drivers are entering their fourth week on strike against the Yellow Checker Star Cab Company after the company imposed a labor contract rejected by 70% of the drivers. Compensation and hours worked are major issues. Sam Moffat is a chief union steward with the Taxi Drivers Union, ITPEU, Local 4873. He says compensation is the same now as it was in 2008, 39% of the meter plus tips. Drivers often have to work 12-hour shifts and pay $55 a week, plus about $3.60 a day deducted from their fares for health care. Moffat says that many of these striking Las Vegas drivers are immigrants chasing the American dream. But while the strike is on, they're urging Vegas tourists to not take Yellow Checker Star cabs. People that came over here with the great American dream as what our fathers and our forefathers did the same thing. And all we expect, all the cab drivers want, is a fair contract. We're not asking for the world. We don't expect the world. But we expect to be treated fairly and be treated as humans. And not only Yellow Checker Star, but every cab company in Las Vegas is guilty of the same thing. And this needs to be resolved and needs to be changed. The forced federal furloughs brought on by the sequester cuts will significantly impact younger workers and their families. Jesse Russell reports. Last week, rallies calling on Congress to fix the sequester cuts were held throughout the country. Howard Eagerman is a social security worker, and he's also American Federation of Government Employees Local 3172 vice president. He attended a rally in East Oakland, California. He said one of the primary concerns is how unpaid furloughs will impact new hires. The people who may be first to go are the newest employees, the temporary hires, who are primarily disabled individuals, Peace Corps volunteers, and what concerns me most, veterans, because I started as a veteran 40 years ago. Eggerman said the 20% pay cut that will result from the furloughs will overwhelmingly hinder younger workers from being able to pay their bills and get ahead. I have worries about our younger people not being able to pay their rent, not be able to pay their car note, and for instance, one of my colleagues has something like $100,000 in college loans. I'm concerned about the young folks. That is my major concern. Workers Independent News puts workers and their unions on the national radio news airwaves every day. To help keep labor's voice on the air, go to laborradio.org. Workers Independent News made possible in part through underwriting support from the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. You've been listening to Win Workers Independent News. For more information, visit laborradio.org. Well, here's the top 20 bills on the Hill from Congress and from our friends at popvox.com. That's P-O-P-V-O-X dot com. The PopVox Weekly Bill Roundup for the week of February 1st through 7th. Well, it looks like this week we get a break. Americans are not being held by gunpoint. Meaning, not all bills this week are gun-related. However... With the new news this week that our government can use drones against us, we might be safer in our streets because of the new gun laws they're making. But can we say the same about the comfort of our own home? <laughs> Looks like the blizzards in the Northeast are not the only snow job we're getting. Well, here we are, the top 20 bills. And remember, my views are my views on these bills, and I share them, but you don't have to hold them. Number one. S-174, the Ammunition Background Check Act, a bill to appropriately restrict sales of ammunition. Number two, H.R. 437, the Assault Weapon Ban, to regulate assault weapons to ensure the right to keep and bear arms is not unlimited. Number three, S-179, Gun Trafficking Prevention Act, a bill to prevent gun trafficking. I've said this before and I'll say it again. This bill is a little bit like saying that, uh, well, I guess dishonest people will go to honest methods to get their goods. I mean, how can you create a law for people who don't follow laws? Number four, S-150, the assault weapon ban. Number five, H.R. 367, the regulations from the Executive in Need of Scrutiny Act, which is an acronym is RAINS. That's fun, like raining, you know. Here's what it is. 
It's to provide that major rules of the executive branch shall have no force or effect unless a joint resolution approval is enacted into the law. This one seems to be about not allowing the person to make a decision on their own. It needs to be voted on. I'm not sure, but I think that's the reason that we have our political system in trouble the way it is. Too many people can't make a decision on anything. I say the president was voted in, so let him do his work. Otherwise, politicians, you might find yourself on the president's list. The drone list. Checking it twice. Number six. Common sense legislation to end gun violence. Maybe this bill, because it's been here so long, should be renamed Give Me a Scent Every Time Someone Says or Does Something Dumb with a Gun. Number 7. H.R. 444. The Require Presidential Leadership and No Deficit. It's called Require a Plan Act. This bill basically states that the president has to give his fiscal year 2014 budget. And if he doesn't achieve one, a balanced one, then he has to give a supplemental one. You know, here's a funny thing. What they should just do is hire a, a mother of three who's lost her job. Let her balance the budget. I can guarantee you she'll know how to get a dollar to stretch a lot further. Number 8. S46. The ensuring the full faith and credit of the U.S. and protecting American Soldiers and Seniors Act. I bet the Congress doesn't even know what that one means. I'd check popbox.com if I were you on that one. Number 9. H.R. 431, to restore certain authorities of the ATF to administer the firearms law. Number 10, H.R. 449, the Veterans Heritage Firearm Act. Number 11, S. 82, the Separation of Powers Restoration and Second Amendment Protection Act. A bill to provide that any executive action infringing on the Second Amendment has no force or effect. Let me see if I have this right. We want our government, our president, not to be able to make decisions unless we say that he's making the right decisions. And yet, we want to be able to use our guns to point and shoot at anything we feel threatens us. That makes sense. Number 12. The Common Sense Concealed Firearms Permit Act. A bill to establish minimum standards for states that allow the carry of a concealed firearms. Minimum standards? Scratch that. Should be maximum standards. Number 13. S33. The High Capacity Ammunition Feeding Device Act. Number 14. HR 427. The Trafficking Reduction and Criminal Enforcement Trace Act. To prevent the legal sale of firearms. Number 15, H.R. 410, the Restore the Constitution Act, to provide that any executive action infringing on the Second Amendment has no force or effect. <laughs> okay, we get it. You don't like our president. Number 16, S. 35, the Stop Online Ammunition Sales Act. Number 17, H.R. 452, the Gun Trafficking Prevention Act. Number 18, H.R. 138, the Large Capacity Ammunition Feeding Device Act. Number 19, H.R. 235, the Veterans Emergency Medical Technician Support Act. And number 20, H.R. 117, the Handgun Licensing and Registration Act. Well, that's it for this week. That's your weekly bill roundup from PopVox. That's P-O-P-V-O-X dot com. We'll see you next week. You're listening to We Act Radio, WPWC, 1480 AM. Visit us online at weactradio.com. You're listening to We Act Radio, WPWC, 1480 AM. Now get out there and do something.
Ring of Fire, I'm Sam Cedar. Today on Ring of Fire, investigative journalist Josh Israel will tell us why the IRS needed to investigate the Tea Party. Author and journalist Stephen Rosenfeld will talk about the growing corporate influence within the White House. You can follow Ring of Fire on Facebook or on Twitter at Ring of Fire Radio. And you can keep up with the latest progressive news on our website at ringoffireradio.com. And now you can tune in to Ring of Fire every Sunday at noon on Free Speech TV. If you want to help support Ring of Fire, you can subscribe to our weekly podcast or you can sponsor an hour of our show. You can sign up for both online at ringoffireradio.com. All right, all right, okay, uh, all right, okay. So, Pap, uh, quite a week for uh, scandals, both uh, real and imagined, uh, this week in Washington. Uh, Starting from the real and then moving more into the fantastical, there was a report at the, the beginning of this week that the Department of Justice had subpoenaed extensive, I mean, and this is really the issue, um, months worth of phone records, cell phone records, home phone records, office records for multiple offices of the AP in pursuit of a leak investigation stemming from a 2012 story by the AP that uh, revealed the the thwarting of a plot by uh, Al-Qaeda affiliated groups, basically Underwear Bomber 2. And uh, this is a story that was released in Uh, in 2012, May 7th, I believe. And that's relevant because uh, we recall that at the time, the Obama administration was upset with the AP. They had asked them to sit on the story. The AP sat on the story for a week and revealed it the day before the Obama administration was going to make a public announcement of it. The AP, according to the AP, they had checked with officials. There was no national security uh, issues there. And now we see that Eric Holder, and he must have signed off on the subpoena, has um, subpoenaed, and secretly so, uh, two months' worth of of phone records for over 100 AP reporters. And this is just unprecedented. Thousands and thousands of records. Well, you know, look, uh, to understand Eric Holder, to understand what happened here, you have to understand Eric Holder. I mean, to understand why Obama is where he is right now, is I think about this. This is a DOJ that's infiltrated and spied on on the Occupy movement leadership because uh, uh, somebody in the administration believed that their protests surrounding Wall Street created a danger for the mega banks. That, by the way, Eric Holder's Covington Burling. Washington, D.C. law firm represents. Okay, that's that's the first thing. That was kind of a dead giveaway. Whose side is this on? Uh, this is a, an AG that has the government spying on and reporting on environmental activists who had the audacity, I guess, to demand that Obama actually take meaningful actions on issues like global climate change and uh, greenhouse gases being released from power plants and uh, the XL pipeline that is has the capacity to destroy the most active drinking water aquifer in America. So at the, here you have a president that's watching all of this. He's let, let's let's assume it would be naive and stupid to assume this, but let's let's play naive and stupid. Let's assume the president doesn't know who this guy really is or doesn't really understand him. He has that much history so far that this is just the beginning but then he has eric holder soldiers who have targeted and prosecuted whistleblowers who believe that this administration and the last administration committed criminal violations with torture at gitmo uh, eagle Ill, illegal use of drones targeting americans that they organized robbery by america's defense contractors so in in fact the priorities of eric holder team has been so crazy that the whistleblower, one of the whistleblowers who actually listed the names and events of criminal conduct at Gitmo, that whistleblower was prosecuted and the criminals were promoted. Okay, so now, again, Sam, you're the president and you're watching all this. The president then watches his attorney general spend millions of dollars, thousands of man hours, witch hunts, on witch hunts with uh, after people like Aaron Schwartz, who the, they ultimately drove to commit suicide, or the, Wiki, the WikiLeaks team who embarrassed both Obama and the GOP team of giggle heads who, 
who ran the international affairs for the shrub in the GOP. This is your guy that you're watching. You, this, all this is developing. Imagine you're the president. You're reading the newspapers because maybe you're so naive or so informed you didn't know any of this, so, but you're reading the newspaper. You read in the newspaper that Holder is an AG who's brought charges against six whistleblowers under the 1917 Espionage Act, mm -hmm. more than has ever previously done, been combined with all the administrations combined. So at some point, and, and add to that, you're watching your guy as he gives immunity to AT&T. He gives immunity to Verizon. He's the one who pushes that card. He gives telecom immunity to AT&T and Verizon. He's the one pushed, that pushed all that. He expands FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, expands it to uh, the point to where, I mean, it would scare the bejesus out of Franz Kafka if he were still alive today. So, so this is the picture of, you have, of what you have working for you. And it's very evident that this is not an attorney general who's going to rise to the standards of Robert F. Kennedy or Ramsey Clark. This is an Edwin Meese. This is an Alberto Gonzalez. This is a John Ashcroft. And, Sam, when did you and I, I mean, think back, when did you and I start talking about the fact it's time to get rid of Eric Holder? It was first term, right? Mm -hmm. About the second year of the first term, we started seeing it. We said it's time to get rid of this guy. Now, you can defend, take it from there, defend this president, say, 